Uh, open your Bibles, please, with me tonight to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. I'm going to go through this book tonight. It's a short book. This is actually a sermon I preached about four years ago uh, with some slight variations. Uh, but it's a good sermon that we all need to hear every now and then about the prophet Jonah. I'm going to preach about the sign of the prophet Jonah tonight. We're going to read, uh, first of all, we'll just go ahead and read right through here, through chapter 1 of the book of Jonah, which says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. But they said, Every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the man knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. And then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. By the way, verse seven here, 17 says that the Lord had prepared a fish. That's worth, worth noting there. That means that this special fish had been prepared beforehand because the Lord knew beforehand both what Jonah was going to do and also how the Lord was going to deal with Jonah. This had to be, by the way, a very special kind of fish. I believe this was a fish Actually, it had to come up for air. Some Christians who try to correct those who refer to this story as Jonah and the whale, uh, they say this was a big fish and not a whale. But I do have news for you. Actually, this creature was a big fish that was later revealed to be a whale. And keep your finger here and turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. I'm going to start in verse uh, 38. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus said, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So, some say wrongly that this whale here that Jesus talks about uh, in Matthew chapter 12 it should have been translated fish. That the King James has it wrong, it should have been translated fish. But I'm going to tell you that's not so. This was properly translated as whale. The Greek word for fish 
in Strong's uh, Concordance, uh, number 2486, it's ichthys, but the word here that's translated is actually katos. Strong's word 2785, that's the only time this word appears in the, in the New Testament. And whale is the proper translation. So this was actually a whale. That word is not translated wrong in the King James Bible, by the way. And so it should not, it should not be translated fish, but whale. It's interesting how some, by the way, KJV extremists get mad you know, when you resort to the underlying Greek to expound a verse. So you don't need to do that. You're a Bible corrector. But they don't squawk or get mad when you use the Greek or the Hebrew to actually prove the King James Bible. But that's what the, actually the Greek does here in this case. Uh, so why does the Old Testament say it's a fish and here the New Testament says it's a whale? Because the Lord prepared a fish and it was a special fish that we found out was a whale who would have to come up for air, I do believe. While this is one of the most famous of Old Testament stories, there are many who say that this story should be interpreted spiritually as an allegory. They would say that Jonah actually represents Israel and that the sea represents the Gentile nations and that uh, this whale actually uh, symbolizes the Babylonian captivity. Some actually interpret it that way. But this is not an allegory or a fairy tale or a fable. This actually, uh, this actually happened. Jonah is actually referred to as one of the minor prophets. It's a small book, but it's a minor prophet with a big message. And I have a few points here I want to make from the text. Back to the book of Jonah. First of all, I want to say that, the, that Jonah, the son of Amittai, was a historical figure who really lived... And this is a true story to be taken literally. And I've got two good reasons for saying that. And the first reason is that Jonah himself, Jonah the son of Amittai, is mentioned elsewhere in the Old Testament. He prophesied actually during the reign of Jeroboam II in, from about 790 to 750 B.C. In 2 Kings uh, chapter 14, verse 23, we read, In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned 41 years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord and departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath into the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath Hefer. So Jonah was an actual prophet of God who lived and prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam II. The second reason that I believe we need to take this story literally, as a, not as allegory, not as a fable, this story is just as true as is the resurrection of Christ. If this story is a fable, then so is the resurrection of Christ. In Matthew 12, we just read, the Lord Jesus said, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He said, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, the greater than Jonas is here. Jesus treated this story as, as a true story. And by the way, if Jonah didn't uh, spend three days and three nights in the heart of that, of that whale, the Lord needed to Jesus uh, rise from the dead. So if, if the story of Jonah... And the whale is allegory, and so is the resurrection of Christ. But of course we know it's as true as it can be. There's another well-known story that you probably have heard. I'm going to recount it anyway. And for those who haven't heard it, there was a girl, actually a Christian girl in public school, in public high school. And she was a good witness. She had a good reputation as a Christian. One day in science class, a teacher made a remark about evolution, about the earth being billions of years old. And this girl raised her hand and asked how he knew that. You weren't there. How could you know that? And he said, because our science books say so. And she told the teacher that evolution was scientifically impossible. And she uh, waxed eloquent and told him why it was impossible and couldn't have happened. And that the Bible says the universe was created by God in six days. And the teacher said, the Bible? Do you believe that book? And she said, every word. Well, I believe every word. And he said, well, surely you don't believe the story of Jonah and the whale, do you? And she said, of course I do. And the teacher said, you tell me how Jonah survived, tell me scientifically how Jonah survived three days without air. And she said, well, I don't know, but I plan to ask Jonah that when I get to heaven. And he said, well, what if Jonah didn't go to heaven? And she said, well, then you can ask him when you go to hell. <laughs> the moral of the story, you probably heard that. The moral of the story is that Jonah was a historical figure and that uh, this is a true story to be taken literally. Back to Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. 
Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Notice the great honor that, that God bestowed upon Jonah. This is the only time in the Old Testament, by the way, that any prophet was sent to a pagan nation with the gospel, with, the, with God's word. There were many prophets in Israel, Old Testament Israel. Samuel and Elisha, by the way, both had schools of prophets. Uh, out of all the prophets, God chose Jonah to go to Nineveh. He must have been a great man of God who loved the Lord, loved God's word. And he knew God's voice, by the way. He wouldn't have got it wrong. He didn't misinterpret what God said. He just rebelled against the word of the Lord. Notice how Jonah, this great prophet who was honored by God, dishonored God in response. Verse 3, but Jonah rose up. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with him into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah knew the Lord. He knew the word of the Lord. He knew God's voice. He knew God's will. And he refused to obey. He rebelled. This is an act of outright rebellion and defiance against Jonah's God. There's a couple things that shows us. Number one, notice how sometimes the best men of God, the, the best of men, perhaps even the best of Christians, can fall when God leaves them to their own devices. Never put your faith in any so-called man of God. Every so-called man of God can fail and stumble and fall into sin. And by the way, this is a lesson that we learned the hard way. Never put your faith in any so-called man of God and never trust a preacher who calls himself the man of God. Don't ever trust a preacher who calls himself the man of God. Verse 3, but, jo but Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the ferry thereof and went down into it to go with him unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The second point I want to make here is Satan always will produce, will provide an easy way for us to fall into sin. There was just this boat sitting there, you know, and, and there it was. Just as God prepared a fish, so Satan prepared a ship going in the opposite direction of where God had told Jonah to go. The ready way, by the way, the easy way, is very rarely the right way to go. Satan will always provide an easy way for us to get out of God's will. The easiest path is almost always the way directly opposite of God's will. And the hardest path is often the one that God has chosen for us to take. It would be easy, for instance, for us as a church to incorporate and to water down our message and to draw you know, a bigger crowd and borrow some money and buy some land and build a building. It would be easy for us to do. But that's not God's will for us. And God's given us a difficult path to follow. Why did Jonah disobey? The Bible says in chapter 4, verse 2, it says why Jonah disobeyed. It says, And he prayed unto the Lord, Jonah 4, verse 2, and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Jonah didn't want the sinners in Nineveh to repent or to find God's mercy. He didn't want them to get saved. That's why he didn't want to go to, to Nineveh. How can you save these wicked people? Perhaps he was jealous for Israel as the, you know, the dispensary of God's law and God's, God's word. Uh, perhaps he didn't want, to, want God's word going out to Gentile nations who may actually then take Israel's place as God's kingdom. Don't know. Perhaps he just hated the Ninevites. The Ninevites were very ruthless, evil people. Nineveh was the capital, by the way, of the Assyrian Empire. Assyrians were infamously barbaric. They were barbarians. They were well known for their extreme cruelty to peoples that they'd conquered. Uh, God said, though, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah probably conversed with God. He said, I cannot do this thing. This is where I draw the line. I can't do this, God. By the way, where do you draw your line? Why do you say, God told me to do this, but I'm, I'm not going to do it. I can't do that. Where do you say, I know this is your will, God, but I'm not going to do it. Do you do that? Do you rebel against God's will when you know what it is? 
You have a line that you draw. So, no, I'm not going to go there. Here's a warning to you if you do that. God crossed Jonah's line, and he may cross yours also. If you say, this is where I draw the line, I'm not going to go there. God crossed Jonah's line. Jonah chapter 1, verse 4. The Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. There was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Jonah thought, apparently, that he'd be safe here in, the, in this boat. But God pursued him with this great wind, producing a storm the likes of which these hardened sailors were very afraid of. They'd never seen. It came up so suddenly, and it was out of nowhere. And it says, and the ship was like to be broken. These were hardened sailors that were very fearful of this tempest that came up all of a sudden. Verse 5 says, Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay, was fast asleep. You know, it's commonly said that there are no atheists in foxholes. These men, these pagans, all of a sudden learned how to pray when they were in this situation. And some people actually will not be brought to prayer until they're in, until God sends them terror, sends a terror into their lives to bring them to repentance. Though these men did not know the true God, the Bible says every man cried unto his God, and they became, by the way, men of prayer. It says, but Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. By the way, there's only two men in the Bible that are found sleeping in a boat in the midst of a terrible storm. That's Jonah and the Lord Jesus. It's interesting and worth noting, by the way, that both knew how to calm the storm. The difference is that Jesus was sleeping because he had perfect peace. He had perfect peace and he knew there was no reason to fear. Not so with Jonah. There is, by the way, no peace of mind for a believer who is out of God's will and who knows that he's out of God's will. Jonah was probably sleeping for sheer exhaustion, uh, for having not slept for days. He probably deprived himself of sleep because he didn't want to hear God speaking by a dream. He didn't want God to speak to him in a dream. It took the fear that God instilled in non-Israelite pagans to wake Jonah from his sleep. By the way, sometimes sleep is a sign of willful ignorance rather than having peace with God as it was in this case. Many Christians today are definitely asleep while they should be awake as well. America is being destroyed before our very eyes by domestic enemies from within. And most Christians just go on sleeping. They just go on sleeping. Don't bother us with reality. You know, as the prophet Isaiah said, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Don't wake us up. Verse 6, So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, and so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. By the way, no one blamed himself. No one blamed himself, including Jonah, who knew it was his fault this had come to pass. He knew the storm was his doing. Jonah, by the way, could have spared these men the trouble of casting lots by just fessing up right away, but he didn't do that. Uh, by the way, when evil circumstances do befall us, it's best for us to quickly repent and fess up and get right with God. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal if there's something that I've done to cause this, what's going on in my life as well. If there's any sin that we need to repent of, you know, if there's anything that I've done that you can reveal to me and not wait for others to come show us what, what our sin is. The Bible says if, if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And if Jonah had done that, he may have helped these men out. Verse 7 says, the, the end of verse 7 there it says, So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What's thy country? And what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. That means, you know, Jehovah, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And said so they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. He said unto them, Take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Now the sailors didn't want to do that. You know, if Jonah was a prophet, they didn't want to anger God even more than he already was angry. Nevertheless, 
It says in verse 13, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord, Jehovah, and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, O Jehovah, we, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. They called upon the God of Jonah, didn't they? So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. And the men feared the Lord, Jehovah. They feared the, the God of Jonah exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. So by the way, despite the fact that Jonah was in rebellion, even in his rebellion, by the way, he was still a very effective prophet. And these men turned actually in repentance to the Lord as a result of Jonah just being in the boat. Everywhere he went, the pagans, by the way, turned to the true God, Jehovah. Perhaps maybe that's why God sent him to Nineveh. Maybe he's just that, that kind of preacher. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, verse 17. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I can't pass over this verse without mentioning that uh, in this time, this big fish that breathed air, after sleeping in the boat in the midst of the storm and showing the sailors how to calm the sea, Jonah clearly and obviously served as a type of Christ, obviously, as, as Jesus said that he would, that he did, as a sign to the nation of Israel. We read already in Matthew 12, 34 to 41. And by the way, even after Jesus gave the men of Israel, the Pharisees, this sign of his resurrection and told him then what was going to happen. They still rejected him. The Roman guards came to the council and told them exactly what had happened, that this angel came and the stone rolled away from the door and this man rose from the dead. They told them that Jesus had risen from the dead, in fact. Matthew 28, verse 12. So then when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the, unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. They bribed these guards to lie about what had happened. They didn't question the story. They didn't check it out for themselves. They didn't go and see what happened. They bribed these guards to lie because they believed the story. They knew it was true. So as Jesus foretold in Luke chapter 16, he said, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded. Neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. Back to Jonah chapter 2. Jonah's prayer. This great prayer of repentance and praise and, and recommitment here in Jonah chapter 2. The whole chapter is Jonah's prayer. It says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. He cried and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I. And thou hurtst my voice. Some say that he, was, he had died in that, uh, inside that fish, and he came back to life. Some say that. For thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy bellows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet will I look again toward thy holy temple. The waters can pass me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee into thy holy temple. They that observe lying and vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed, and salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Some, as I said, believe that this prayer shows, in keeping with the fact that Jonah is in this story a type of the Lord Jesus, that Jonah actually died inside this fish and was brought back to life after three days and three nights. The language here in verse 6 does indicate that to be a possibility. Uh, I think it's possible, but not necessary. I do think that Jonah could have survived inside that fish, inside that whale God wanted him to. This, remember, was a special fish, a whale that God had prepared, perhaps a special whale that didn't uh, feel all too good about having a prophet in his belly, and so you know he stayed on the surface with his air intake open all the time. We don't know. Uh, we'll have to ask Jonah about that when we get to heaven. But we, uh, we do see in chapter 2 a great prayer of repentance and recommitment to the Lord. Uh, that our gracious and merciful Lord, by the way, heard and found acceptable and answered. The Lord spake into the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So then chapter 3, a very interesting verse, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, 
and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Jonah is not only forgiven of his rebellion, his defiance of God. He's not only preserved and saved alive through this ordeal, but he's also fully recommissioned as God's prophet. Notice that God does not tell Jonah that he has disqualified himself for service because of his rebellion. There are many men today who would say that Jonah had disqualified himself biblically to preach. Uh, there are many men today whom some would say actually are not qualified to preach, whom God may well call to preach anyway. I personally never met a man yet who perfectly fulfilled every requirement for the elder, perfectly as Paul describes in 1 Timothy and elsewhere in Titus. Jonah messed up. He directly rebelled and defied God's command. But he received not only a full pardon, but also a full recommission as God's prophet. We probably all heard from this story that God is the God of the second chance. God is the God of the second chance. But that's not true, by the way. God actually gives far more than just two chances. God gives us far more than just two chances. Proverbs 24, verse 16 says, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. In uh, Matthew chapter 18, the apostle Peter came to Jesus in verse 21 and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times. See, Peter thought he was really being magnanimous there because the Pharisees thought you should forgive someone three times. And so Peter said, shall I forgive my brother seven times? Jesus said in verse 22, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. In other words, without limit. That's how God forgives us. He's not just the God of the second chance. He keeps on forgiving and he keeps on forgiving. Verse 3 of chapter 3. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. By the way, that doesn't mean it took him three days to get there. It means Nineveh was a huge city that took three days just to walk around the circumference of the city. It was a very large city on the Tigris River, 400 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea with a population of several hundred thousand to possibly a million people. In fact, we read in chapter 4, verse 11, the close of the book, God asked Jonah a question. He said, should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand? He's talking about small children there. So there is 120,000 just small children in the city. So it's a very large city. 19 miles long, north and south, and 11 miles wide, uh, 60 miles in circumference. It had 100, 100 foot high walls uh, that were 20 feet wide with 1,500 towers that were 200 feet high. It was a huge, huge city. The first mention, by the way, of Nineveh is back in Genesis chapter 10, verse 6, where it says, The sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Phut, and Canaan, Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh, the city of Rehoboth and Caleb. So it's a very old city, very old city. Chapter 3, verse 4 it says, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For a word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink nor water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will return and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Verse 10 then says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. So Jonah's preaching was a huge success. It brought a great revival in this wicked, evil city and a great turning to God, at least for a time. Uh, Jonah, however, was not happy with his success. 
And this, by the way, this is the only time in the Bible that a man got mad that he was successful at what he had been sent to do. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before thee into Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee my life for me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Dost thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east of the city, made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what, what would become of the city. I'm just going to watch what happens here. He wanted the Lord to destroy the city like he said he would. And the Lord prepared a gourd. The Lord God prepared a gourd. First he prepared a whale. Now he just prepared a gourd. Made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm. I love that. There's really this humor in this story here. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. It came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished himself to die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? You care more about this gourd than you do these millions of people in this city? He said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. And said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd which thou hast not labored, neither made it grow, which came up in the night, and it perished in the night. Should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score, 120,000 persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, meaning, again, young children, and also much cattle. Jonah is a minor prophet with a major message. Great lessons from this book. First of all, we talked about the fact that the easiest path is almost always the, the way that's directly opposite of God's will. And the hardest path is usually the one that God has chosen for us to take. Also, uh, when evil circumstances befall us, we should quickly examine ourselves and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal any sin that we need to repent of ourselves and not wait for someone else to reveal our sin. If we'll judge ourselves, we'd not be judged. But I've talked about those. But also here in this story, we see that we should never underestimate the great mercy and long-suffering of God toward his children, and towards those whom he wants to save. He's not just the God of the second chance, but he really, his mercy really does have no limit. Psalm 136, verse 1. It says, I'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Then there are 25 more verses in that psalm, each one of which ends in that phrase, for his mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. And then the most important lesson, I think, from this story is that God cares about people that we don't care about. God cares about people that we think He should not care about. Second Peter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness. But is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God takes no delight in the death of the wicked. He's long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. That's why He sent Jesus, by the way, to the cross. God cares about people that we may even have a tendency to hate or to find completely unlovable. God loves them and cares about them. Furthermore, He wants us to care about them too, more than this gourd, more than our own life, more than our own house and our own shade tree. He wants us to care about them Jonah, by the way, is the only book in the Bible that ends with a question mark. The only book in the Bible that ends with a question mark. It's the only book that God closes by saying, here's something I want you to think about. Should I not spare Nineveh? Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. God even cares about the cattle. By the way, the Bible says a righteous man regardeth the life of his beast as well. God asked a question of Jonah. We don't see that Jonah actually answered the question. He didn't answer. It's a rhetorical question, basically, that requires some introspection at the same time. Demands an obvious answer. 
The obvious answer is, yes, Lord, you should care about them. And so should I, by the way. What was the message that God gave Jonah? Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The message was simple. Repent or perish. Repent and turn to your God or you'll be destroyed. We have been given that same message, basically, to take to our generation. Repent and turn to God or you're going to be destroyed. Basically, it's the same message. Well, I don't like telling people that they have to repent or they're going to go to hell. They've got to believe or they're going to go to hell. I like telling them that. Well, Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That's the message we're supposed to preach. Repent or perish. Repent or you'll be destroyed. We must preach to sinners that if they do not turn to Christ, there will be a hell to pay. Whether we're comfortable doing that or not, we must get this word out. It's the same word that Jonah was sent out to preach. Repent or perish. For the wages of sin is death. And the death God has in view, by the way, is eternity in hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But the apostles just preached in public. They didn't go house to house and knock on doors. They, weren't, they didn't go knock on people's doors and bother them while they were at home. Well, Acts chapter 20 says, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mine, with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and taught you publicly and from house to house. They went from house to house by the way of preaching the gospel. That's something we should do too. Testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks. Repentance toward God. And faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been given a command just as Jonah was given. We've been entrusted with a message to preach. Where do you draw the line? Where do you say, I'm going to go get on a boat. I'm not going to go preach that message. Are you preaching the message you've been sent to preach? Where do you draw the line? Most Christians do the same thing Jonah did. We're too busy worrying about our little gourd or our house, you know, our own shade tree, what might happen to us. We have no concern for the people around us that are going to go to hell one day. Sometimes even our own family members are going to go to hell. We don't op open our mouths to tell them. Repent or perish. We've been given a message to preach. Time is short here and now. Eternity is forever. It's forever. The Bible says, He that winneth souls is wise. Paul says, To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. He says, I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And I do this, Paul says, for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Paul says, Know ye not that they which run, uh, run in a race, run all, but only one receives the prize, Paul says. So run that ye may obtain. Run to win is what Paul's saying there. In that context, he's saying, care about saving men's souls like I do. That's what he's saying. Run to win. Run for the prize. Save souls. Take someone with you to heaven. And as we know, the Bible says there will be a great reward for those who have obeyed Christ's command to reach the lost. The Bible says in Daniel 12, verse 3, that they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So rather than being like Jonah, we need to be wise. Let's care about souls. Let's care about obeying the mission that we've been given to preach the gospel to the lost. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we, uh, we thank you that you have entrusted us with the gospel. I pray, Lord, that we would not just care more about our gourd than getting people saved, that we would not have a disdain for people and with an attitude. They, they deserve to go to hell. I deserve to go to heaven. Lord, deliver us from that kind of an attitude. Deliver us, Lord, from an attitude that says, I just don't care if they go to hell. Give us, Lord, a, I pray, a compassion for the lost and a heart that desires to obey you and to preach your gospel to those that need to hear it. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let's close with a song uh, that Jonah finally learned how to sing. And that's hymn number 388, Have Thine Own Way.